May I welcome my Senate and House colleagues to this historic room. It was four years ago when we met in this very room on the heels of the convention. At that time, we had high hopes, great expectancies, but considerable doubt. Today, we are once again in this room. And at this point, I know I speak for everybody in this room that those high hopes have been substantially realized, as have our expectations. And all of us feel distinctly proud in having in our presence a great President of the United States. <clears throat> Open this pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, and particularly for all the inspiration we received as it all began with a presidential prayer breakfast. We thank you for our being able to meet like this, openly in freedom and without fear, while millions of our fellow human beings all over the world are denied this simple, basic right. Make us always mindful of our obligation as elected political leaders to set for ourselves the very highest standard of performance. We're mindful, dear Lord, how miserably short of the mark we fall at times, and we ask for your forgiveness. On this historic occasion, we ask for your special blessing upon our President and Vice President as we all begin another significant march together. We thank you for the special qualities of leadership. He's a great man, a great politician a great friend of the President of the United States and a great friend of ours. And I want to say from firsthand and daily experience that I've never worked with a man who has a keener sense of the importance of his mission and duty, a keener sense of his understanding of his responsibilities to his nation, to the Senate, and a keener sense of responsibility and the importance of making the Republican Party the vital, responsive, and successful organism that it is than in Paul Laxalt. And we congratulate you, Paul, for what you've done. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, my colleagues in the Congress, it is a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to stand here on this platform in this historic room and in a moment to introduce the President of the United States. But before I do that, permit me to say that I have worked with President Reagan now for three years. I've served as his spear carrier in the Senate of the United States as his friend and confidant. And I want to tell you on my own responsibility and with absolute certainty and conviction that we have here in this room a man who has already become one of the truly historic presidents of the United States. <laughs> and privilege to present to you now the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, please. Thank you, Howard. I, I could have listened right through lunch. I, I, I'm, and I want to thank all of you, and after that kind of a welcome, I don't see how I can possibly get by with less than 42 minutes. Uh, no, I'm delighted we're all able to be here today. And in our jobs, we work together day in and day out. But it's too seldom we get a chance to relax for a moment together like this. And permit me to begin by giving every man and woman in this room my heartfelt thanks. For three years now, You've been giving me just what I needed, advice at critical moments and support during some tough times, and balanced judgment all the time. Howard and Dick and Ted and Paul and, well, I better stop naming names because I'll go on. Bob Michael and Guy, Trent Lott, all of you are among the most skilled legislators that I have, I have ever known. And uh, George, I believe that 
very firmly that you're the best vice president in our history. I once said sometime after my marriage that Nancy's mother had ruled out as far as I was concerned, had made it impossible to tell any mother-in-law stories, and I feel the same way about vice president stories after watching him work for three years. But um, as Power said, they, they told us three years ago it couldn't be done, and uh, that members of the Congress would never again work together to produce a program that would benefit uh, not the special interest, but the American people. And we all remember the mess the country was in, the soaring inflation, the high interest rates, the weakened defenses, the loss of respect for our nation abroad. Just after the inauguration, I came across a quotation that summed it all up. When we, get into, when we got into office, President Kennedy once said, the thing that surprised me most was to find that things were just as bad as we'd been saying they were. <laughs> Well, I think in these three short years, there has been a great deal accomplished here. Just before I came over here this morning, I was meeting with someone, a title of ambassador, but who serves in one of our, the international organizations overseas, and on his way back to that particular assignment. And uh, he told me how uh, one, I won't name the country, but the, one of the his colleagues there from another country came up to him when he was newly appointed and uh, just asked him whether he thought things were going to be different now. And our ambassador said, yes, they are. Well, he said, in what way? He said, when you kick us in the shins, we're not going to say thank you anymore. <laughs> We still have our work cut out for us. We must use our restored strength to put world peace on a more secure footing. And soon I will forward a plan based on the recommendations of the National Bipartisan Commission on Central America, just one example of how we can promote democracy in, in these troubled regions. And here at home, we must attack the deficits and simplify the tax code and make constitutional changes like like the line item veto and the balanced budget amendment. I think these are the Republican goals for 1984 and beyond. And now let's take a moment to consider the Democrats. Tip O'Neill always complains about the way we cut taxes. But if the Democrats had been in charge, there wouldn't have been any tax cut, none at all. They opposed the very idea of a tax cut again and again throughout the 1980 campaign. But if you look back over the years, the American people, and maybe this campaign is a good time to remind them, look back over the years and you will find they aren't tax cutters at all. The tax cutting that has been done back through the years has been done by the Republican Party. If they had been running the show, American families would still be suffering sky-high inflation and interest rates. The stock market wouldn't have set new records, gross national product wouldn't have started growing again, and the American workers' real wages wouldn't have started climbing. With them in control, our defenses would still be growing weaker while the Soviets grew bolder. Troops would have landed on Grenada, that's for sure. They just wouldn't have been American troops, and the Grenadans wouldn't have been applauding. So let's approach this election year with the high spirits and the sense of challenge that's such an important part of American politics. We can tell the people that, yes, America is back, but we're not satisfied with that. We're not resting on our laurels. Our challenge is to take freedom's next step, and this nation's future is at stake. If we keep the Senate and the White House and remain strong in or even with the House, then America will go on to a new birth of freedom and prosperity 
and all the world will benefit. If we lose, then all that we've worked so hard to accomplish will be undone. We all know the elections will be hard fought and close. Since a campaign flounders without ideas or intensity, let's make certain that we take the offensive. We must challenge our opponents on the line item veto, push them on the balanced budget amendment, and challenge them on tax simplification. We must force them to stop gathering special interest endorsements and go to the American people. And we must make it clear that they don't want to cut spending, they want to raise taxes. I promise to do all I can to see to it that we keep the Senate and gain strength in the House. And for the sake of our cause, let's all pledge to work together in a spirit of firm unity. For the good of the country, we must win. And I'm convinced that working together, we will. Thank you, and God bless you, and now the words you've been waiting to hear from me, let's eat. Thank <laughs> you.